Great. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for inviting me. This is uh, marvelous to have a workshop on this topic. It's near and dear to my heart. No normally, it's just kind of a session and a bigger, a bigger meeting, so we really have time to get into uh, issues. And to focus on a specific topic like Canadian radio astronomy will mean that we're not um, diluted all over the world, so to speak, except in my talk. Uh, I'm going to be laying the broader context, uh, as you see from my title, um, looking at the world and as a whole. How did this get started? Uh, who are the major players? Uh, and I'll be focusing on the decade after World War II. I'm not going to take it beyond 1953, 54 um, in what I'm talking about. So just that first critical decade. So I want to try to get us back in the flavor of that time. Um, I call this, if you had Homo radio, a new species, and they were looking at the sky, this is what it would look like. Uh, John Krauss and uh, <coughs> Ron Bracewell both put together pictures like this, and I've adapted it in various ways. Um, but you know, what's the dominant thing if you're down at 50 megahertz, where a lot of people were in that decade? It's the Milky Way. The, the sun is just another source, and it's not as strong as Cass, um, for instance, in the sky. Uh, it's the Milky Way. So the sun, of course, is the one that's going around the sky. Uh, the others are staying fixed in a sidereal sense. Uh, you've got this band. Uh, you've got this concentration towards the center of the galaxy. That's interesting. And of course, all this is at very low resolution. And so you don't know what these things are. You, if you, you can't look at a photograph and say, ah, that must be what it is, because your resolution of a few degrees, uh, typically, until you get into the early 50s. And then the other thing that that showed, but here it's uh, more <coughs> um, technically done. These are the spectra of the key sources in that post-war decade. And once again, once you're down below 50 megahertz or so, uh, the quiet sun is a good bit less than Cass A and Cygnus A. Now, you can get solar bursts, of course, that are a million times brighter than the, than the quiet sun. That, that, now, that's amazing in itself. Consider uh, we had the quiet sun, and uh, sunspots came and went, and nobody had actually ever made any measurements that showed that there was a few tenths of a percent difference in the solar output. But here in the radio, it was a million, a factor of a million. So this is an entirely different world, not to speak of the equipment itself, uh, relative to uh, astronomy that had been around using the uh, traditional telescope since the time of Galileo. Uh, a note here that is important uh, in how things developed in the different countries. At the higher frequencies, you not only have weaker sources in general, except for the moon and the sun. Um, but receiver sensitivity is much less. When you're in the microwaves, that's the pioneering part of the spectrum. And uh, your noise temperatures are much higher. And so in general, it's much easier to do radio astronomy down here. And it turns out it was very fruitful to do it there. So just a one slide summary of, of this project on the history of radio astronomy that has literally been four decades now. I started very innocently. I got my degree under Frank Kerr at the University of Maryland in, <clears throat> in the early 70s. And I said, you know, all these pioneers from World War II, but most of them still alive. Uh, I just stuck a microphone in front of them with a new cassette recorder, high tech thing at that time, um, and uh, didn't really know what I was doing. But over the next few years, I got more and more serious about this and ended up interviewing 250 people. Uh, my goal was to interview everyone who had published at least one paper before 1960 in the field of radio astronomy. And I got about 3 quarters uh, of that criterion. Now, in the uh, study that eventually became Cosmic Noise, the book, um, I only used 115 of those interviews, because the idea originally had been to study the history through 1960. It was going to be two volumes. Well, it took me 38 years to get the first volume done. Uh, and so the second. Uh, material, which is most of the people, 140 of the people, um, came in later. Um, that is at NRAO, as, you, as we'll be learning this afternoon, uh, all those interviews, but I did not use them in the book. I only used the ones that were relevant to the post-war decade. Also, over the decades, mined all the archives I can find around the world at all the major observatories, n not just uh, radio, but uh, places like 
Uh, Caltech has Jesse Greenstein's papers, for example. Uh, Jan Ort's papers are at Leiden. Um, and all of these are in process of being transferred to uh, NREO for the use of any, any future historians. Um, <clears throat> along the way, there were two byproducts before getting to cosmic noise. Classics and radio astronomy is a collection of reprints of what I consider classics in this same post-war decade, 37 papers with commentary on them. Uh, and in the early years of radio astronomy, reflections 50 years after Jansky's discovery is an edited volume with <clears throat> contributions from people like Arthur Covington, um, from uh, Chris Christensen, Ron Bracewell, uh, Lovell, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's, that's a nice volume that came out in the 80s. So in this talk, I'm only going to say a little bit about Jansky and Reber before the war because of time. Uh, there'll be very little mention of meteor radar, which was another whole field. But I will be getting into it because it was one of the things that got started in Canada uh, very early on. Lunar radar, I'll say nothing about that. Uh, that was a subfield. Um, solar astronomy was by far what most people were doing in the post-war decade. If you look at by percentage papers, you know, two-thirds of all the papers are on the sun. But I'm going to be focused on, focusing on uh, not to that extent, but uh, more like a, maybe a third of what I'm talking about will be solar astronomy. Um, I will, at the end, uh, put in the beginning of Canadian radio astronomy, which was a very small uh, player uh, in that first decade, but an important one. Uh, very little on theoretical developments. For instance, synchrotron theory um, was known in a synchrotron uh, accelerator on the Earth, uh, but was it relevant to the heavens? Well, it turned out that uh, it was, but I'm not going to have time to get into all of that. Um, and then I, I stop at this point. You know, the real reason is because uh, you know, it was enough time, 38 years, to get the book done. But I had to justify it. Uh, the field was well established. Uh, it had become integrated into uh, optical astronomy uh, so that you weren't talking about two camps of people as much as you were but, um, earlier on. <clears throat> and it was becoming mature. Uh, large dishes were being built. You couldn't just build things at your observatory. You had to go out and find a million dollars uh, to build your dishes. Um, and so it was becoming a different kind of an animal, become more like the big science uh, that we're so familiar with uh, today, uh, rather than um, these uh, World War II pioneers uh, who just went out in the field and put together some dipoles and some yagis and, and uh, just had to have a couple hundred dollars to do a significant experiment. Um, here are the major historical themes uh, that permeate uh, my study of the post-war decade. Um, first observers uh, had trouble establishing their legi legit legitimacy. They were not astronomers. And the astronomers often reminded them of that. Uh, for instance, they didn't know about precession. You know, they, they'd come with a map to the optical astronomer, and you say, you know, what's there in that part of the sky? Well, you've got right ascension declination. You have learned about that. But what epoch is it? Epoch? What are you talking about? Um, so. Uh, some optical astronomers were very helpful, to say the least, and, and we'll see many examples of that. But uh, the, the, this was a, they were different. They were engineers and physicists. Uh, and there were only a few uh, optical astronomers that really got involved in, in a major way. Um, radio astronomy, as we know, turned out historically to be only the first stage of the opening of the electromagnetic spectrum. It was the pioneer in that. And so when X-ray astronomy came along in the early 60s, as an example, they didn't have to argue with the astronomers that this was legitimate. They could call it an X-ray telescope, even though it was something packed into the nose cone of a rocket and didn't look like a telescope. But a radio telescope? What the hell are we talking about here? Uh, that terminology. We'll talk about terminology a bit. Um, and, uh, and finally, I call this the 20th century's new astronomy. Uh, mid-20th century's new astronomy. Um, and I, here are some earlier examples. Galileo, uh, they're, and they're all technology-driven. Galileo takes this new technology of, the, of this spy scope and uh, applies it to the heavens. Um, that, and that revolutionized things, as we know. William Herschel, the same thing with the idea of building large reflectors in order to look into the <coughs> fainter sky and not be so concerned about uh, precision in putting together star catalogs, which was very important for navigation. But it was, he was doing a completely different kind of astronomy with new technology.
the astrophysicists in the late 19th century, uh, photography and spectroscopy uh, were the new technologies that drove the idea that you could not just catalog where stars were, but you could see how hot they were, and you could talk about their evolution and so forth. And radio astronomy is right uh, in, in those you know, century kind of importance. Uh, further themes. Uh, radio astronomers did not create a new discipline. They, they could have gone off and could have been a different discipline. Uh, but they slowly merged into traditional astronomy. And we'll see a little bit about that story. But ironically, they sought to be part of a visual culture. And so here are examples of that. They were always trying to make radio images. So it's something that I can show uh, the, the legitimate astronomer. Uh, they were always searching for optical identifications. You could be confident that you had something if it had an optical identification. That legitimized it. Um, and eventually, they joined in in terms of producing PhDs at places like Harvard uh, and Leiden in traditional optical observatories. But that, that took a, that's getting more into the late 50s in, in general. Uh, I call radio astronomy technoscience. I was interested in the question of, does technology drive science or vice versa? And some of you may well have things to say about that uh, in, in these two days. Um, I, I could not make up my mind. Uh, it's a back and forth. It's a dance uh, as to uh, often it's, it's a new technical capability, a new kind of receiver that gives you more sensitivity, say, or a bigger dish. And uh, you just go out and take a look, and all of a sudden you've got pulsars. You looked at the sky with a different, different way. Um, on the other hand, uh, often it is science that's driving it. For instance, the classic example is the prediction of the 21-centimeter line by Hank van der Holst. Uh, which then led to people going out into the sky to try to uh, <clears throat> see if this theoretical uh, prediction um, bore fruit. And of course, we know that it did, and I'll say a little bit about that. And then the really key thing that I've already said about is that R World War II and then the Cold War afterwards really shaped this field tremendously because this technology had come out of World War II, but then there was a lot of funding, especially in the uh, U.S. and Canada, too, as far as that goes, um, because of the existence of the Cold War. Low-noise low receivers, big antennas, were important for a hell of a lot more than just figuring out whether Taurus A was the Crab Nebula or not. <clears throat> and, of course, that still goes on today. So now let's get into the story itself. Carl Jansky, unfortunately, died as a young man in uh, 1945, um, but just out of... Uh, uh, Undergraduate uh, major in physics at the University of Wisconsin, went to work at Bell Labs in New Jersey, um, and was assigned to look for sources of interference to the recently opened transatlantic radio telephone service. So for $75 in 1929, you know, something like $1,000 now, you could have a three minute phone conversation short wave with London. And this was a big deal, but only stockbrokers could afford it. Um, <clears throat> trying to beat the market in between London and New York. Uh, in any case, there was interference. And Jansky built what he called his merry-go-round. Uh, many of you have seen the uh, replica of this at Green Bank. If not, uh, definitely visit Green Bank to see this, as well as Reber's original dish. Uh, but the Jansky thing is a replica, but an accurate one. Um, and um, the merry-go-round turned every 20 minutes. And it's called a Bruce Array. <coughs> Uh, in, in essence, it's uh, parallel dipoles. And it gives you about a 30-degree beam um, on the sky. Oops. Yes. Um, and here's what he found. So every 20 minutes, he's turning. And you can see that uh, you get a repetition. But you can see that it's varying depending on the time of the day. This is just one specific day in 1932. And unfortunately, it's the only record we have left. The rest of it all got burnt sometime during World War II. Uh, let's just burn all that stuff. Uh, probably uh, Jupiter bursts and probably solar bursts, although it was solar minimum, uh, are present somewhere in Jansky's records. But this is all that we have this one day that he published. Um, so why is it varying? What direction is it varying in? He found there were three sources of interference, and the one that we know was this strange, steady hiss. And he literally has earphones on, um, and <clears throat> he says, what is this? And it took uh, three papers and a couple of years to sort it out and be convinced that um, it was not due to the ionosphere, it was not due to the Earth's atmosphere, it was not man-made interference. Uh, 
Uh, it actually, he did not make this map. I made this map based on this one day. Of course, every day was the same uh, recording for him, because he's just going round and round the same every day. Um, but the sidereal time is shifting it all. Uh, and he had to learn about sidereal time. That was the key to it, actually, was learning about sidereal time. An astronomer friend said, um, it's coming at different times. Do you, do you know about sidereal time? Sidereal time? What, what are you talking about? Uh, that turned out to be the key to it. And he saw that the peak was associated with the centers of the galaxy. He learned about the center of the galaxy, uh, which Oort's theory of the 1920s had said that over in that direction, uh, towards Sagittarius, we seem to be going around uh, that direction. Um, and so if you put together this data into a contour map, you can see that you have the strong, he, he actually, uh, the galactic center did not get quite down uh, or up high enough into his beam. His beam was looking up at an angle like this. Um, and so he actually did not uh, have it in his beam. But very strong there. Uh, even a little hint of Cassiopeia A showing up uh, in his data. Jupiter and the sun were up there on uh, this particular day. No, no sign of them. But as I say, uh, Jupiter certainly must have shown up uh, on other days. He publishes this in the Proceedings of the Institute of Radio Engineers. And what do the radio engineers make of this? I mean, he had to spend four or five pages explaining what right ascension and declination were, uh, for instance. Uh, it was interesting, but what can you do with it? And basically, nothing did uh, happen with it throughout the 1930s, um, with the one exception of this guy. And I always like to say, if you look like this at age 25, you're going to go places in the world. Road Reaver. So he's a very talented uh, radio engineer, to say the least. Uh, he's often called a, a radio amateur, like he, he was just a ham operator or something. He was a ham operator, but, but uh, much, much more than your average ham. Uh, but the main thing is his uh, personality. Uh, he decides on his own time, with his own money, in his backyard, to build a 30-foot dish to follow up on Chansky's uh, measurements, because he's read about them in the proceedings of the IRE. Well, the IRE, some of the Institute of Radio Engineers, uh, the predecessor to the uh, IEEE. <clears throat> um, and this is it. Uh, now, no one had built a dish bigger than four feet. There were a couple experimental microwave dishes in the 30s. Uh, so, you know, so what F over D ratio should you have? What surface accuracy should you have? Uh, how is it going to deform, you know, depending on where you're looking at? Uh, you know, what's the whole design? Well, he just did it. Uh, and uh, he largely constructed it himself, too. He, he did uh, have help with a, a local uh, metalworking shop. Uh, it turns out that the diameter of the dish, he wanted it big. He knew that because uh, he wants to look at higher frequencies. Jansky's at 20 megahertz, right, right down in so-called short waves. We still call them short waves. Uh, because they were shorter than the long waves that uh, most communications was going on in those days down at one megahertz. Um, uh, but he knew he wanted to go to higher frequencies. Um, and he knew he wanted a, a large collecting area. You know, how do you design the feed? Um, but so what is the size? The size is he could get 20 foot two by fours lumber. And so if you can make a square out of four 20 foot two by fours, then that determine the size of the dish, a little bit of overhang, uh, as examples of uh, the, the design. So I've got um, a few uh, audio clips uh, from the interviews. And here's the first one uh, from Reber, <coughs> interviewed in 1976, with much thanks to Ellen Bowden, who has uh, overseen all of the digitization of these cassette tapes. Um, and uh, Sierra Smith was assisting her at this time, too. So let's see if this will work now. It was the man he called a sagging doctorate. He said, it was the first class to cover his name. And nobody was going to do anything about it. So, so there, what I did, as long as it was something new and different, I seemed as though I just couldn't go wrong. And so I thought it all over, and I decided that Betty Crook was a chance he had was really unsuitable for this test. And hence he goes to the large dish. 
And so greatly compressing things, um, he was working at various Chicago area uh, radio firms during the war. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then he would come home and, and observe at nighttime uh, when there was less interference. He's living in suburban Chicago. Um, and he's, at first, he's, he's recording, looking at you know, an ammeter, and he's recording every minute uh, what the reading is. Then he gets a fancy strip chart recorder. Um, and he can set it up and it can re uh, record by itself for a few hours. Um, he was the first to make a contour map. And these are two contour maps. Um, don't have time to go through it. He started off at 3,300 megahertz, which was very experimental, 10 centimeters wavelength in 1939, before the war even, um, and found nothing. He knew Jansky had found something at 20 megahertz. He says, all right, I'll go down. So he goes down to 900 megahertz, still nothing. Well, I know it's got to be there somewhere. And he finally got down to 160 and found it. And then he went back up to 480 a few years later with a more sensitive receiver. This is what he finds. Um, the Milky Way, much more detail. He's got a 12-degree beam and a, and a uh, four-degree beam uh, for these two surveys. Um, he talks about these concentrations, and he thinks maybe they're spiral arms or something. Uh, but we know that they're Cygnus A. Um, and Taurus A showing up. And here's Sagittarius A down here. He's got dash data down here um, at very low declinations, minus 40 from Chicago. So what happened there? Well, big snowstorm. <clears throat> Have you ever worked out uh, how much a foot of snow is on a dish? It, I found out the hard way once with it, observing with something very similar to your, uh, <clears throat> your Kennedy dish out here. Um, back in the 60s, uh, because I was slewing, and then I turned the slew off, and the damn dish just kept going, because of all the weight, and put the emergency brake on. Fortunately, that worked. But anyway, he comes out one morning after a snowstorm, and the dish is just down. It's just from the weight of the snow. Well, he says, before I fix it, you know, there's some damage. I'll just take data down here. You know, it's way out of range. I'll take data down at minus 45 deck, looking over my house. <clears throat> um, and so that's dashed down there, <laughs> getting down into uh, the southern hemisphere. Um, so Reaver published data, uh, this, and the Proceedings of the RE. He actually published uh, a couple of papers in Astrophysical Journal with the titles, all the titles of his no articles were Cosmic Static. Um, and um, he actually talked to Otto Struve, who was the director at Yerkes Observatory at the time. And the, and the uh, editor of AppJ. Um, he, he actually gave a colloquium at um, uh, Yerkes Observatory with various receptions uh, to it. Actually had a delegation of people. There were many delegations, but the first one was even before the war, 1940 or so, before the US got involved in the war. Um, uh, delegation of people to visit him in Wheaton. You know, okay, you, you, you bring these strip chart records, he rolls them out and says, I found this stuff in the Milky Way. Look, we got to go see this guy, you know. And they were very impressed, of course, when they actually saw his, out, his outfit and his care and doing things. Um, so there's a lot more to say about Reber. We don't have time here. Fascinating guy. Uh, he, he's obviously an iconoclast. Uh, his, he went off and did many other things later in his career. Uh, nothing was ever as successful as this. Uh, this is when he hit it, hit, uh, hit it big. And he also, also could never work in any kind of institutional environment. He was just a loner, had to be working by himself. Um, this is to emphasize the importance of World War II. So here we have before the war, Jansky called it star static. Reber calls it cosmic static <coughs> and cosmic noise. Um, and then. Uh, there's radio engineering, of course, developing during the war. Ionospheric physics, the, uh, understanding the ionosphere is critical for communications for both civil and military uh, purposes. This leads into the war where radar and electronics in general are developed to a tremendous extent, only second to the atom bomb project in terms of the amount of money spent. Uh, radar was the second biggest uh, technical project in, in World War II. Um, and what did this lead to? Well, first of all, many, many people who had not read 
Reber and Jansky, discovered that there was excess noise in the receivers. They'd, they'd have a nice noise temperature for a receiver on the bench. They would take it out to the sky, and you know, it, it just was, wasn't operating well. Where the hell was all this extra noise coming from? And then someone would say, I think I remember a weird paper 10 years ago about sky noise. Excess background. There were anomalous echoes that were coming from radar. Uh, short scatter, I'll say something about them. They turn out to be meteor uh, trails. Um, solar interference. Uh, it turns out World War II was mainly in a solar minimum, uh, which helped those that had better radio technology um, more than it helped those that didn't have it. it you know, if it had been a solar maximum, the uh, radio technology could not have been as effective. In any case, solar interference, which turned out to be of course, uh, <clears throat> solar noise. Uh, so after the war, it develops into solar noise, meteor and lunar radar, and the cosmic noise, and then the discrete sources come in a few years after the war uh, in, a, in a major way. Uh, and so you get this kind of a development. And only down here in the early 50s, eight years after the war, is it radio astronomy. <clears throat> but notice that here, it was just astronomy. Have you ever thought about the fact that radio astronomy invented optical astronomy? <laughs> it did. And <clears throat> it, this took place around 52, 53, when people are starting to use that terminology, although a little bit before then. Well, let's remind ourselves that World War II uh, was great for technical development in a lot of fields, but it was a, a nasty business uh, around the world. And this uh, short poem by Bertolt Brecht is really telling. The designers sit hunched in the drawing offices, one wrong figure, and the enemy cities will remain undestroyed. Uh, it's often been called the physicist war, as opposed to World War I, the chemist war, uh, let's hope we never have a biological war for World War III. Um, and these physicists are the people that are going to be the pioneers of uh, <clears throat> early radio astronomy. And here's a person that, uh, given this crowd, met, uh, many more of you are familiar with him, uh, but many of you probably are not. John Stanley Hay, very critical person in early uh, radio astronomy. He, he was a high school physics teacher. Drafted in, in, in England, uh, dr drafted as so many were uh, to work on radio and radar work with crash courses uh, for six weeks. And then, uh, you know, way beyond that, uh, he made many major discoveries. He was part of the Army Operational Research Group. They were troubleshooters. Uh, so you, you had a radar sets out in the field and something was happening and uh, they would come in and try to see um, whether it was equipment problems or was it the ionosphere, what was going on. And it's these gun-laying radars, and here you see some women uh, who were, I was going to say manning them, uh, women that were womening them. Um, uh, these are going to be, uh, these are scattered around the coast in England. These are going to be the ones that detect uh, the radio sun. Uh, and so how did that happen? Well, on a certain day, two days actually, you see them there in February 1942. This secret report was put forward. It took me about 10 years to actually follow this. There were always lots of references to it, but you could never find a copy of it. Finally found one. Anyway, just take a look here. The interference um, appeared on the CRT, the cathode ray tube, in the form of a very high noise level in all cases except Site 13. Uh, the the whole gun-laying frequency band appears to have been covered by the interference, and a considerable proportion of the sets were rendered inoperative. Uh, the bearing and the elevation given was always that of the sun, which could be observed in the telescope. So many of these had boresighting optical telescopes, and um, when these guys looked in there, <laughs> they said, oh, there's the sun there. Uh, a lot of them didn't also, but when it could be checked, and so he went over to Greenwich. He said, what about the sun on this day? Well, it turned out that there was a huge sunspot group right there on the central meridian uh, that day. And so Hay makes the conclusion that this interference is associated with the sun and the recent occurrence of sunspots. 
Now, that doesn't mean that it's electromagnetic radiation originating in the sun. It could be in the ionosphere. You know, it, it could be the sub-sun part of the ionosphere that is getting affected by the solar activity. Um, but he, he felt pretty certainly that uh, it, it was um, direct from the sun. Uh, this shows you where these various um, gun-laying radars were along the coast. And here's the key plot. Um, here are the azimuths, bearings, of the different uh, stations. And here's the azimuth of the sun uh, through, through that day. And so the correlation was, uh, was very strong. Uh, now, you can look back in the 30s, and you can see amateurs that heard some hiss uh, when they were doing communications. And in retrospect, it appears like they probably did have the sun. But nobody ever said it in so many words. And Hay is the one that really um, established it. Now, of course, this was not published until after the war in nature. You let the Germans find out for themselves uh, that the sun is an interfering source of radio emission. <clears throat> Southworth and Reber, uh, Southworth at Bell Labs and Reber by himself uh, during World War II, likewise detected the sun, but now the quiet sun at higher frequencies, not these low frequency bursts. So we've got Hay detecting the sun. Second thing that Hay did, his group investigated these ionospheric E layer short scatter things that had been known through the 30s. And, there was a reasonable amount of evidence that uh, they were due to meteors. But then they didn't correspond to meteor showers. Uh, and there were other ideas. So it wasn't certain. So once the war ended, Hay took advantage of having all of these <coughs> stations w w fully uh, occupied uh, with nothing to do. And over six weeks in the summer of 1945, he had them all point to the same place in the sky and try to correlate these uh, short uh, scatter phenomena. And here you see kind of bursts. This is the range here in, in kilometers. And here's time uh, going, going this way. And these bursts come for just a second or so. And here is the result of it, that from these three stations that were looking like this, uh, you got peaks that did, uh, were at different times for each station. And he made the assumption that it was the same group of meteors, a meteor shower-like thing that was being picked up for some reason uh, by the stations at different times during the day. And he then also uh, took a theory that uh, uh, someone had developed in the 30s, I'm forgetting who right now, um, that a meteor would make an ionized trail and that you would get a specular reflection if you were looking. So if the trail's like this, you get a specular reflection this way. If you're looking down the trail, it has a very small cross-section. And so if you put those assumptions together, when you get an echo, uh, the meteors are going like this, and, but you only have the distance to it. And you don't know whether it's here. These, these uh, are very um, broad beams, you know, 100 degrees kind of beams. So you don't know where it is. You know it's somewhere on this circle around you. And the other. One knows it's somewhere in this circle. The other one knows it's somewhere in this circle. In this way, he was able to come up with a radiant for the meteor shower. And so this, in fact, was the first daytime meteor shower. Uh, we, you know, we always thought they must be there. But all we knew about up until uh, <coughs> radar meteor came along, uh, meteor radar, was that uh, about the nighttime ones. The third thing that Hayes Group did uh, <coughs> was to take this in foggy London uh, and to map out the Jansky-Reber radiation. Uh, and they made a nice Milky Way map. But the really important part about that was that uh, one of their team, uh, John Phillips, uh, found that the part of the Milky Way in Cygnus was fluctuating in intensity. What the hell's going on there? The rest of the Milky Way repeated day after day. Uh, but this fluctuated in intensity. And so now this is after the war. Uh, and so they published um, uh, in Nature right away. Uh, and this is the discovery of Cygnus A. What did they deduce? They deduced that it must be a small source. But they deduced it for the wrong reason. Uh, what they said was that uh, not that it had to be small because uh, of the effect of uh, 
if it were large, the ionosphere would smear it out. But they said that the time variations were such that it had to be a small source. Uh, so they're thinking of stars, radio star that is varying with time. And if you had a diffuse kind of a uh, interstellar cloud or something, it wouldn't be doing this. So uh, this is about a two degree beam that they had. And they could specify, of course, they looked on a photograph of that part of the sky, saw nothing unusual. It's right down in the Milky Way. Uh, didn't know what it was. But it became known as Cygnus A within a couple of years after this. So now let's, so Hayes group uh, prospered for two or three years after the war. And then it was shut down for radio astronomy purposes uh, as the Cold War got worse with the Berlin blockade and so forth. And Hay did a bit of work in the 50s, but um, pretty much nothing more. But incredible the contributions he made in a short time right uh, before the war ended and uh, right afterwards. At the telecommunications research establishment, which is the key laboratory or laboratory uh, in England, for radar research, the equivalent of the radiation, <clears throat> the radiation laboratory at MIT and the radiophysics laboratory um, that we'll hear about in Sydney. Um, Martin Ryle, Bernard Lovell, many others, this is where they worked for six long years uh, for, the, for the British war. And as soon as the war was over, or well, even before, when it was clear that um, it was going to be ending in the next year, they were being heavily recruited uh, back to the universities by slightly more senior people like uh, Jack Ratcliffe, who was an ionosphere uh, expert of the time at Cambridge, and Patrick Blackett was a cosmic ray person that uh, brought Lovell back to uh, Manchester University. Here you see Martin Ryle uh, at TRE at the age of, of, of 25. And now we have a, a um, quote from Ryle about the Michelson interferometer, which, which he developed in particular uh, for radio astronomy, and so I asked him here, well, you know, where did that come from? You know, was it because you remembered from high, sc from high school physics, maybe even, or college physics about the Michelson interferometer? And uh, this is his answer. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got to, uh, I'm, I'm looking on my elapsed time for my talk here rather than uh, I need to click here. Yeah, here we go. I don't think this arose by analogy with optical Michelson, because I said I've forgotten what to do by then. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it arose from the idea that if you have um, allowed by steps into aromatic phase, then this could fairly easily uh, tell you something about some back source, and you can make that now. Now, by separating the elements, uh, well, we, we, we were reinventing the Michelson barometer at the year, but I think it came from the sort of world thinking about uh, thinking of aerial travel and mm -hmm. saying, ah, oh, I remember the last big book. Uh, this was just a little lead into uh, our session at the end of today. Uh, you can see the trouble in transcribing. Uh, that kind of thing is someone like Martin Ryle who never completes a sentence. His mind is just going so fast. Uh, there's lots of decisions to be made, even in the shortest paragraph, as to what you say is the, the transcript. Um, so Martin Ryle uh, does take the two element interferometer, a Michelson interferometer, and uh, just starts putting these dipoles further and further apart out on the rugby field. Uh, it's where they started at Cambridge University. And here you see one of it, well, is it, this is his first publication, um, where he's here at 10 wavelength separation, here 140 wavelength separation, looking at the sun. And he gets these very high brightness temperatures um, with the narrower beam, uh, indicating for the first time uh, we knew that the uh, radiation was coming from a very small uh, part of the sun. It wasn't coming from, indeed, coming from an active area, although he couldn't pin down. All he knew, had was a size. He, he couldn't get the uh, position of it. He didn't have the phase that well. Um, and so this was the theme of his career, of course, for the next 20 years, eventually leading to a Nobel Prize, was more and more about interferometry. How can we be, make images, ultimately, not just fringe amplitudes? Uh, here's one important step, the long Michelson, it was called. Uh, so this is just one element 
of the long Michelson. The other one is a similar one, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, half a kilometer away. Uh, and this is just an array of dipoles ab above a ground plane here. And this is what did uh, what became known as the 1C survey, which you don't hear much about. Uh, in 1950, this is a typical record for the 1C survey. Once again, of course, every day was identical to the previous days. Taurus A, OK, that's, that's there, uh, very strong. Uh, but what about these guys here? Uh, these are two different days, and you know, they're not the same. And is this a, Should we catalog this one or not? Anyway, they came up with 50. Uh, but as we're going to see, these positions of these 50 radio stars where the timing gave you the right ascension and the periodicity of the fringes gave you the declination, because you have an east-west array, did not correspond to anything that uh, allowed you to make an optical identification. Uh, here is Ryle's group. Uh, <coughs> Graham Smith, who's still alive, is in early, early 90s now. Uh, Tony Hewish is still alive. Uh, Peter Scheuer. Um, Ken Machen was uh, one of the solar experts. John Baldwin just died a couple of years ago. Uh, John Shakeshaft is still alive. Did he die? Uh, how, how long ago? Oh, OK. So I, did, I didn't know that. Um, <clears throat> and so th this group grew uh, to this kind of size by 1954. And uh, Ryle is this charismatic figure that uh, ruled. And uh, 150 miles away at Jodrell Bank at University of Manchester, uh, Bernard Lovell is likewise developing a group with a wholly different uh, style. And they are mainly doing media radar until the mid-50s. Uh, they, they do some passive radio astronomy, especially once Hanbury Brown arrives. And he's unfortunately not in this picture. Um, but they are mainly doing media radar, and we'll see the statistics on that. They were the world leaders uh, in that field. So greatly cutting to the chase here, these are four early radio astronomy surveys. The 1C is one of them, uh, two from Australia um, by Mills and uh, Slee and um, who's the other S. Miller? I got SS for uh, Stanley. Stanley and Sleep. Yes. And now we're not we're, we're not up to Hill yet. Uh, Hambury Von Hazard here. There's a lot of information through here, and I've here are the five big radio sources around the sky, but I've also got bright galaxies, our red triangles, bright stars, our uh, green diamonds. Uh, here's the galactic plane. The basic message, folks, is nothing is correlating with anything. These are not galaxies. They're not stars, the brightest stars. But unfortunately, the radio surveys where they overlap are also not correlating with each other. That's the big problem. And this leads to something I'm sure people are going to be talking about, um, about the problems of confusion and reliability. Uh, in some sense, this was the low point of, re of radio astronomy in terms of uh, its acceptance uh, by by skeptics. And then there's the question of what is all this original Jansky radiation coming from? Um, and just to give you an idea of the tremendous variety of ideas in the early 50s, here are six models that were put together. Um, and he, the number that I have by the, this is looking at the galaxy edge on here. Here's the sun out here. Here's the center. Uh, this number is the typical distance between the radio stars whose integrated effect is taken to be the background, just like the optical Milky Way gives you an integrated effect. Um, and so you see you, here they're only three parsecs apart from each other. Here they're 25. Uh, the density here gives you uh, some kind of a logarithmic representation. Shklovsky had 10 to the 12th radio stars in a huge halo. Uh, people put in some gas in order to get them to work in the galactic plane, uh, where you got um, as you went to higher frequencies, you got more radiation, uh, more strongly concentrated in the plane. It was a mess. Uh, no one could really figure it out until the synchrotron radiation idea came along in the early 50s. Thank you. Terminology can be very important. Um, I've got to move along here. Uh, 
radio astronomy, where did that term come from? It turns out that Ginzburg in Russian first introduced it. Um, and then in the West, uh, Pawsey used it in a letter. Ryle used it in a talk to the RAS shortly thereafter. Uh, the Commission on Radio Astronomy was set up by the IAU in 1948. Other terms, radio telescope. Well, the first person to use it was actually Edwin Appleton in 1945. The New York Times says the term is erroneous. This took quite a while for this term to catch on. Uh, radio observatory, where we're at now, uh, Van der Hulst, uh, used that uh, in Dutch, one of the, and it was used in an IRSI report. Optical telescope, that goes way back, but because you can find an odd usage doesn't mean that it, that it caught on. It, both of these optical things took quite, quite a while to catch on. The idea of two windows was also uh, used by Appleton. Here's an example, Otto Struve, you know, one of the prominent mid 20th century optical astronomers here with his, proudly by his Buick. Um, unfortunately, it's not yet been possible to perfect radio telescopes to such an extent as to match the actual resolving power of the human eye or of a real optical telescope. <laughs> now, you, you could have a whole discussion um, of semantics. Why didn't you just say optical telescope? I think what he meant was a real telescope. And then he said, well, they might not know what it means. I'll say real. I mean an optical telescope. So the, these are not unusual to find these kind of things. Um, uh, another optical astronomy, the ability to carry on one's observational research nearly independently of conditions of weather or daylight appears peculiarly unastronomical. <laughs> but the radio astronomers likewise use astronomical that way. Here, Henry Brown and Hazard, Hazard are saying detailed comparison of the radio observations with the astronomical data. That's not the radio data. Um, I better skip this, and I better skip this. Down to Australia, uh, the Brits shared the secret of radar and its associated technology, in particular the magnetron, uh, with the US and Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, Australia. Um, and the radio physics lab in Sydney became the center of the uh, World War II radar effort, and then, of course, the center of radio astronomy after the war. And this person, uh, who Miller is going to talk quite a bit about tomorrow, Joe Pawsey, was the scientific leader um, of that group for the next 15 years after the war. Um, here they're taking an air warning radar on a cliff, and they're looking at solar observations of a rising sun. Um, this is 36 dipoles that are in that array up there. And they're using the sea cliff interferometer. Uh, which is called Lloyd's mirror in optics, namely that if you're looking at a low angle here, an oblique angle, then you can get the reflection off the sea interfering with the direct wave. And so you can have an interferometer with only one aerial. Well, half, only half the budget. Um, and here you see the fringes only come in once the source has risen. <clears throat> and here we are at Dover Heights, uh, which is in suburban uh, Sydney now, or actually, I guess, within the city limits. And there's a nice uh, explanatory plaque there. Uh, if you ever get to Sydney, d definitely do a little pilgrimage there. And here's what they saw. Uh, so time starts here. And all of a sudden, you've got a very strong source coming in. And then uh, the fringes are fading because it's going out of the primary beam. But here, all hell breaks loose. Uh, they happen to have catched a very strong uh, radio flare in February 1946. And in this famous paper by Pawsey, McCready, and Payne Scott, <clears throat> the first, first time the principle is stated that the image on the sky is the Fourier transform of the fringe visibility. In principle, we could put together an image if we had enough spacings. But that's one disadvantage, right, of the cliff interferometer is that you want a different spacing? Well, I guess we have to go to another cliff. Uh, the effective spacing is twice the height of your cliff. And so the Michelson interferometer is much more flexible and eventually uh, won out even by the Australians. And here is Ruby Payne Scott. Uh, and Miller has written a <clears throat> lovely biography, or two biographies, a, a longer one and a shorter one, uh, the first woman that made substantial contributions to uh, radio astronomy. Thank you. Um, Chris Christensen developing uh, grading arrays like this for observing the sun. 
Uh, Paul Wild <coughs> setting up the system we still use today. Uh, he set it up, what, 65 years ago now, uh, of type 1, type 2, and type 3 uh, radio bursts by getting a broadband uh, high time resolution uh, system. And then the radio star work, uh, John Bolton, likewise using the sea cliff interferometer, <coughs> um, but um, is discovering radio sources, but also measuring their angular sizes and getting pretty good positions. Uh, and here are actual fringes. Uh, see, Miller, you found this, right? Um, this uh, actual strip chart recording of fringes uh, when Bolton and Stanley went to New Zealand in order to get some different cliffs. It's not just a matter of different height cliffs. You also want different orientations of your cliffs. Uh, here's what, here's um, the fringes that they published. Um, and with positions that were like 10 or 15 arc minutes accuracy, I think that's worse, one or two degrees, that's right. Um, they were able to suggest in a nature paper that Taurus A was the Crab Nebula. Centaurus A was this weird something. Was it a planetary nebula? Was it another galaxy? And Virgo A was the brightest elliptical in the Virgo cluster. These all turned out to be right, but they were not accepted even, even by the Australians immediately. Uh, it took two or three years to sort it out. And um, in the interest of time, I'll skip uh, this. Um, and what, what did set it out was uh, optical identifications with better positions that were ultimately supplied by Graham Smith and Ryle's group. But I love this cartoon where the guy's looking through the telescope saying, just checking, because uh, we really put much more emphasis on uh, the visual. Uh, when we say, I see, when you say you understand something, for instance. Um, and this is showing how the Cygnus positions were getting more accurate with time. And here's Graham Smith taking, adapting a German Würzburg antenna, uh, two of these for a very accurate uh, interferometer. And he is able to uh, confirm Bolton's identifications as well as get an identification with Cygnus A, which is at this incredible redshift, even though it's the second strongest radio source in the sky. OK, I'm going to skip these so I can get, uh, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to, in order to get the, uh, we'll have to skip the 21 centimeter line. Um, and just pointing out here that this is a fraction of papers that were to do with the sun versus discrete sources and background ratio. Completely dominated in the post-war decade. And here you see how radio physics in Australia and Jodrell Bank were dominating in terms of number of people. This was all media radar. And the Cavendish was in third place. And the rest of the world total was maybe about this much. And in fact, that's actually shown here. Uh, this is showing you all the different groups, how many authors uh, published papers. And here's Canada, is this. Um, and this is the uh, work of Arthur Covington, who, uh, whose PhD was interrupted at Berkeley by the war, came back to the National Research Council, became an expert in microwave. Um, uh, technology and um, Ken Tapping is going to talk about this um, and tried to detect the Milky Way uh, and Jupiter and, and so forth without much luck but then he got onto the Sun and as we know in February 1947 started a monitoring program which is still the key uh, index along with sunspots for the solar cycle. So here you see it going back to February 1947. And of course, it's still done just outside this room um, uh, today. And then in media radar, these are the major groups. Number of uh, publications, you see the Jodro Bank completely dominated Hayes Group. It only lasted a couple of years. Stanford did some work for a few years. And here we are with <coughs> Millman and McKinley, and uh, I'll skip the, here's Peter Millman, and I don't have a picture of Don McKinley. Someone else may be able to supply one here. Um, but he was an engineer. Millman was an astronomer, got his PhD at Harvard. And they got uh, fascinated with meteors. M Millman uh, had done his PhD thesis at Harvard on um, uh, meteors. <coughs> 
Uh, and the key thing that McKinley, t pretty much by himself, but with Millman's help, Millman became really much more strong in the 50s, uh, they show that there were no interstellar meteors. If there are no meteors that come into the Earth at more than 72 kilometers per second, no matter where you look, then they're all bound to the sun. And that was a big argument at the time as to whether there was an interstellar component to meteors. And Todd Bank did it also at the same time. Uh, but this was what early Canadian radio astronomy was, was meteor radar astronomy with Millman and McKinley and Art Covington uh, with his solar monitoring work primarily. Thank you very much. That's the term they used, yeah. And Bowen wrote back, he said, there are two things wrong with microwave astronomy. We're not doing microwave, and we're not doing astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, more questions. Yes, Tom. Yes. Yeah, no, that's a short. Well, there's not time. To, let's let's talk about it offline. But yes, there is a paper by Whipple and Greenstein. Whipple was his advisor at Harvard in the mid '30s, um, trying to explain Jansky's radiation. Very short paper. Uh, they were trying to look at heated dust. Uh, as one cause, for instance, and they just could not explain it. But also, uh, they could not understand the units uh, that Jansky had been using, uh, microvolts per meter and so forth, and they were having troubles uh, with that. And frankly, I'm forgetting the details, but let me look in the appropriate chapter and uh, let's talk about it. Uh, check it out. I'll leave it up here. Uh, <coughs> more questions? All right. Uh, well, let's thank what do you got.